I'm really delighted to be back here in the fall to talk about the new Presidio Parklands project. We've been very busy over the course of the summer, but I just want to remind everybody about the site. It truly is an extraordinary site, and it's really a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity to create a 14-acre piece of new park in the middle of San Francisco, in the middle of the bay, connecting the two most public parts of the Presidio, the main post and Chrissy Field, in a way that they haven't been connected in 75 years. So the opportunity is something, again, that comes along only so often, a place to begin your Golden Gate experience in a new way, the opportunity to create something that's treasured by generations of San Franciscans, the opportunity to create a new beginning point for the visitors that come here to the Presidio. You know, one of the things that we've heard for years is that visitors who come don't really know where to begin their Presidio experience. And the opportunity of this site, located at the new entrance to the Presidio off of Doyle Drive, located in this spectacular setting between the two most public parts of the post, and located in a location where you really understand the importance of these parklands and why they were protected here at the, at the mouth of the bay, you know, at the Golden Gate. All of those opportunities will be provided or afforded visitors that come to the site. So again, a really remarkable opportunity. I think everyone remembers these six project goals. They've gradually evolved in the course of this process. They should look familiar. There were five once, now there's six. The wording has changed a little as we've gotten input from the public. But just to refresh everybody's memory, we want to honor the significance of the Presidio on this site. We want to offer a magnificent experience of the Golden Gate and the Golden Gate Bridge. We want to welcome all. That's the purpose of national parks and cities, to bring national park experiences to a broad cross-section of people in our community and in our nation. Integrate the natural landscape of Chrissy and the cultural landscape at the main post. It's a really interesting site at the intersection of these two very different landscapes. Create the best possible place to begin your Presidio experience and provide exceptional environmental learning experiences. Uh, something that has happened in the park, Greg Moore talked a little bit about the incredible impact of the youth programs here in the park. Uh, and this is something that we want to be able to grow so that we can reach more young people in our work here in the park together. So remind everybody about the project timeline and where we are. Uh, remember, we started this project with an imagine phase, which is something new we haven't done before, where we just had an, a very open and free conversation with the public about what the site wanted to be. We're now in the thick of the design phase, which will come to a conclusion at the very end of 2016. In 2017, when Doyle Drive finishes their project and moves off the site, we'll be rolling onto the site to begin construction. And I'll look forward to celebrating with all of you in the very beginning of 2019, up on the top of the tunnels in this new tunnel top parkland. So I think the, the most important thing is just the role the community has played in this project. Because for me as a landscape architect, it's been a really exciting project insofar as I think the community has gotten involved in ways. They haven't really gotten involved in design projects in the Presidio in the past. So this is a project that was really shaped by the community and, is, and has been shaped and will continue to be shaped by the community. We have had, uh, to date, over 10,000 members of the public involved in the project. This is more than any other project we've worked on, more than the original development of our master plan. It's been fantastic. They've been involved in a myriad of ways. And if you go to our website, there's a compilation of all the feedback we've gotten from the public, and it's quite deep. It's great bedtime reading, because it goes on and on and on and on. But, uh, but, it's, but it's fantastic and rich. And the important thing is that these comments have come in from not only the neighborhoods that are immediately adjacent to the Presidio, but from people all around the city, all across the Bay, and even around the country, people who come to the Presidio, they come into the, the Parklands Gallery, and they've left us their thoughts about the site, because it is a site of national significance, and this is a national park site. It's been great to get so much good feedback from people all over the country. And there are a few themes that have come up, and I just wanted to refresh everybody's memory about some of those. They sort of uh, aggregate into two big buckets, if you will. Uh, the first bucket has to do with this, the character of the site. What kind of site are we trying to create? We've heard a lot of excitement about the potential of this project to accentuate the site's natural beauty, to pull the character of Chrissy Field across the street so that when you're driving down Mason Street, you have the beauty of the Chrissy Field Marsh and the dunes and the dune swale on the other side of the street as you drive down the street uh, so that you have a kind of balanced experience on both sides. That whatever we do, we need to enhance the views, that the views are stunning, they're spectacular, and we shouldn't get in the way of the views. We should sort of step aside and let the views be front and center. The site shouldn't be cluttered, that it should be simple and that it should be serene. And again, this is really relates to the previous point about enhancing the view, that a serene site will really enhance the view. That whatever we do, it should be family friendly. It's very hard to raise a family in San Francisco. There are limited opportunities and resources for families to come together and enjoy the parks in a free way. 
and that whatever we do here should really be family friendly, that it's safe, well lit, and inviting, and that we minimize the use of irrigated turf and that we focus on using drought tolerant plants. Of course, we're in year four of a drought. It's, a, every, it's in front of everyone's mind, you know, being responsible stewards of water in the Presidio and more generally in our community. In terms of experiences, we had a lot of great ideas about different kinds of experiences that people would like to see happen here on the parklands and also more generally in the Presidio because obviously some of these things are already happening in other parts of the Presidio or could happen in other parts of the Presidio. But I thought I'd just run through some of the things that have sort of bubbled up to the top in terms of popularity. Uh, walking among gardens and native landscapes. It's amazing when you ask people the thing they like to do in the Presidio more than anything else, it's, simply, it's the simplest thing, it's walking. Enjoying the view, enjoying nature, having a, a beautiful experience out in the landscape. That people are interested in learning about both human and natural history. As we know, the Presidio has a very rich history. People are really interested in it and they want, to, they want new ways, new opportunities to enjoy it and to connect to it. People are interested in passive recreation and informal exploration. Opportunities to engage in educational programs and outdoor learning, service learning type activities. A lot of support for the idea of creating flexible spaces for the arts. Not the idea of creating a permanent installations, but using the this sort of this site as a platform for a temporary art program, changing art program. Creating opportunities for fun, creative play and exploration. Again, a, a real interest in creating opportunities, particularly for youth, but also for old kids like me to, uh, to come to the Presidio and have fun and play. So what you'll see tonight, I think, in the presentation that Jim gives is that all of this feedback has continued to shape the design. Uh, the scheme continues to evolve. And, and we're at a point along a trajectory in the evolving, kind of ongoing evolution of the project. So what you'll see is a snapshot of where we are today. Uh, and many of these themes that have come up, any of the comments that we've gotten, have had a real impact on shaping the, the design and shaping the forms that you'll see tonight. So where are we in the compliance process? Uh, many of you have come to a, a series of meetings that we have that are related to the environmental compliance process for this project. Uh, in late February, we issued a notice of intent to initiate the environmental compliance process. We launched a scoping period that ended at the end of June. Again, we got a, an incredible array of comments. We're in the process of incorporating those comments into the end, uh, then we'll be prepared to respond to them. We're working our way up to release an EA in late October and an EA environmental assessment, which is an environmental compliance document for this project. And we're hoping once we release that, that the public will review the document and provide us with their comments by December 7th. Then we can continue the process going forward from that. I wanted to make sure everybody knew that as part of this process, we're gonna have an open house on November 4th uh, in the project lab on the ground floor of building 103. It'll be an opportunity for people to come with the benefit of having the document for a couple weeks. They'll be able to review the document, bring their comments, we can answer their comments, take their feedback. It'll be a great way uh, for you to come and learn more about the project and have your questions answered as part of this process. So the last point I wanna make is the point I make at every presentation I give. There are an incredible array of ways that the public can continue to be involved in the process and I wanna encourage everybody to continue to be involved. I wanna encourage you to come to the Parklands Lab on November 4th again. We still have Friday site tours four o'clock on Fridays, meet at the front desk and go out on the site and get a, the benefit of the latest thinking about the project. We're always willing to come to your community group, your neighborhood group, and give a group presentation about the current state of the design. And lastly, I just would love it if everyone here would be our ambassador for the project and get the word out about the different ways that the public can be involved in the project. You know, I think most fundamentally what we hope this project does is finally makes the Presidio the kind of welcoming place that I think we've always hoped it would be. A place where people know where to begin their experience, where they get the resources they need to be able to enjoy the Presidio, and they really feel welcomed. Uh, and that's part of the reason it's been so important to hear from such a broad cross-section of people in this process, because that's the way we can ensure that whatever we build here really resonates with the broadest cross-section of people. And I have been delighted uh, to pivot now to be working on that project with Jim Corner who I'd like to welcome up to the podium, who is going to update us on the current state of the design process for the new Presidio Parklands. Thank you, Michael. Um, I'll try to keep this brief. This is really an update of where we are in the evolution of the design. It continues to evolve. It's like an emerging organism that continually sh uh, shifts shapes and uh, is modified in response to what we're hearing. And we're hearing a lot of things. We continue to hear a lot of things, most of them increasingly positive, which is good. 
But, you know, it really reflects people's passion, the community's passion for the uh, importance of this project. Some things are fairly fundamental, and that is that this is a very, very special site. I have the advantage of not living here, so when I come here, I know how special this is. And many other cities would kill for a site like this. Once the tunnel tops are covered, the connectivity between the Presidio, or the uplands of the Presidio with the lowlands of Chrissy Field and Chrissy Field Marsh and Chrissy Bay and the San Francisco Bay will be truly extraordinary. I like to think that this in many ways is a sort of center point. It's a psychological center point, a sort of navel in the context of San Francisco. In many ways, it, it's where the origins of San Francisco arose uh, culturally and historically. It's uh, significant ecologically and environmentally, and just psychically, to be able to stand on the tunnel tops and rotate 360 degrees and be able to see the panorama that you do see. If you only have two minutes to visit San Francisco, you surely have to do that 360-degree uh, panorama. You see the skyline, you see the Presidio grounds, you see the Golden Gate Bridge all across the bay to Alcatraz and back to the city. So it's an extraordinary sight, and we've heard again and again from people the importance of keeping it open, uh, keeping it uh, serene, uh, respectful, uh, but really celebrating and opening the site up to the views. This is the site a while ago, but you can see the freeway there. The red outline is the property line for the project. You can see the way the freeway really severed the main parade grounds and the upper portion of the Presidio from the lower portion of the marsh, Chrissy Field and the Bay. This is a plan that shows you see Chrissy Marsh in the top, in the lower middle you see the lower portion of the main parade ground, you see the Doyle Drive, the tunnels are beginning construction in this photograph, and on top of that is built this new 14-acre park. And it is designed with a number of features, many of which you're familiar with, and I'll just walk through and update how those different uh, features uh, have been evolving. The main uh, move is to extend Anza Esplanade and to bring Anza Esplanade out to a central overlook, to have what we call the cliff walk, which is this uh, meandering pathway along the top of the bluff. The cliff walk features a western uh, overlook with a view to the bridge, a central overlook with a view out to the bay, and an eastern overlook focused on Alcatraz with a great view back to the skyline. In the center is what we call the Zocalo. Zocalo is Spanish for the uh, community center, the place where people meet. It's the center place. It's, it's where everybody will gather and assemble and be oriented before beginning alternative journeys across the site. This is a photograph um, that shows what the site was and what the site will be as this new landscape is drawn out into the space of the bay. Another photograph showing what the site was. You see here the main parade ground and the lower marsh and the freeway and the significance of this project in terms of connectivity. This particular view is really good to highlight the connectivity that is now available, connecting Anza Esplanade and the main parade ground down to Chrissy Marsh and to the marina and to the beaches, or down this way and across to the marsh and across to Chrissy Field and, and further out towards the bridge. So it really is a new uh, piece of connective tissue. This view is looking towards the bridge. You see the tunnels here under construction and the new park built over the tunnels with also the restoration of Tennessee Hollow in this image. And a close-up of that photograph again, highlighting the connectivity between the upper level of the Presidio and the easy invitation to come down to the marsh and down to Chrissy Field and down to the beach, and vice versa, to come from rollerblading or cycling or jogging or walking and to be invited up into the grounds of the Presidio. This is a photograph that you're uh, looking on the main parade ground today, out to the bay. This you will recognize as the existing observation post building. 
one of the things that we're proposing in the concept plan is to remove that building. And when you do, look at what it does to the view. It really opens up the horizontal view out to the bay. This is a view of what we're calling the Zocalo. This is a view today of the Zocalo. We're trying to leverage the existing Monterey cypress trees that are there to make them a center point of the Zocalo. This is the existing observation post building. When that's removed, look what happens. You just have a very clear view out now to the bridge and to the bay. The cypress trees are cleared of asphalt and parking and all the clutter around them and made into a social place with social seating and a center point for gathering and for meeting. There's one thing I forgot to mention, but not only are we removing the observation post, but we're proposing or exploring a new observation post that would be located here by the Zocalo, something that would actually relate to the functioning and the programming of the Zocalo with a long picture window oriented towards the bridge and another picture window oriented towards Alcatraz and the bay. So it's actually a recognition that the observation post is very successful in terms of providing an interior space with great views, but its location is just uh, wrong at the moment. It's right in the middle of the site. It obscures so many views. If this works out, this location, this does also have the advantage of keeping the existing parking lots and all of the transit arrivals and drop-off keeping that outside of the park so that when you're in the park you won't see any of that parking lot or any of that transit activity. This, as you move out from the Zocalo, you stand on top of the tunnel tops. This is that view today and tomorrow with new plantings. We see the possibility for new horticultural programs and a really rich and interesting program of horticulture. Most of it's succulent and drought tolerant plantings that offer beauty and are very fitting. As you move further out onto the tunnel tops, there are some small lawn areas that are carved out that allow for picnicking and for kite flying. And as you move here to the east, you can see Alcatraz there. We're on top of this tunnel top here. And here we have a meadow planting with a new pathway that brings you to the overlook that focuses you out to Alcatraz. And in the middle is a central overlook. This is that location today and tomorrow with a new seating opportunity. The seat is double-sided. That's important because this is also a great location where you can look back up into the Presidio grounds, a view that you don't presently have today, as well as sitting on the outside of that bench looking outwards. We're exploring the idea of a compass rose in this location. This is a compass rose that would recognize and celebrate the various expeditions and deployments of the military at different times historically to different locations around the world. Each one of these lines is pointing to Japan or to Guam or to different locations around the earth. And then you, you see here the cliff walk with the eastern overlook, the central overlook, the western overlook. Here we're exploring uh, a new um, amphitheater that would be on axis with the Golden Gate Bridge and the bay, um, as well as what we call the bluff walk, which is bringing you down the face of the bluff. This is the idea of seating terraces that are bringing you down to the lower level of the learning landscape, merging new bluff plantings that are very native and very beautiful in their uh, color and texture, merging with a, a series of seating steps that encourage socialization in the space. As you walk down to this lower level, this is that view today, this is the view tomorrow, with new plantings and a new pathway bringing you down the face of the bluff. And as you come down that bluff, you come into what we call the learning landscape. The learning landscape draws across the dune vocabulary of Chrissy Marsh, a series of hills and hollows and dune-type plantings, but nested within that landscape are a series of opportunities for families and for children and for youth, with a lot of programming that is oriented towards 
environmental learning, interaction with environmental materials, collecting butterflies, working with bugs, uh, looking at plants, discovery areas where children can explore with sand and with water and with uh, opportunities for play, and a variety of smaller spaces for community get-togethers, for picnics, and for getting the family together. This is a view from Mason. You're looking at the existing observation post building. This is the top of a tunnel. This is a view today. That's actually a tunnel opening. And then tomorrow, you have uh, the tunnel opening, the new uh, planted bluff, the top landscape with the western overlook and the central overlook, the amphitheater steps coming down, the ramp coming down and the steps coming down to be able to cross Mason, connect to the marsh and go across to the field and the bay, and the new Chrissy Field Youth Center with the learning landscape. There's a proposal to create new pedestrian crossings. We're exploring the possibility of pedestrian signals too, so that if you're wanting to cross, you push a button, the signal will create a stoplight, traffic will be forced to stop. We're well aware of the need to prioritize pedestrians to make sure that this feels safe and welcoming. Uh, and we're exploring a variety of possibilities to tame vehicular traffic and make uh, Mason feel more pedestrian. This is the learning landscape. Next to that is the existing Chrissy Field Youth Center. And there's an additional two buildings proposed to enhance the programming and the capacity for that facility. They're framed at the moment to create an interior space, a sort of outdoor classroom that can be protected and inviting. And working with local architects, EHDD, they're exploring various vocabularies for how those buildings could be very simple and open and be able to be open and closed to the elements and to the weather. So that concludes where we are at the moment. We are continually editing the design to simplify it, to make the design disappear, if you will, and to let the external environment appear. I love this image, again, because of its connectivity, but also because of a reminder of look at the extent of parkland here in relationship to the city. I mean, there's no other city that has that very stark juxtaposition between dense urban living and really open natural resources of an extraordinary sort. And our site is right there in the middle of all of that, uh, a centerpiece and a connective hub and a nexus. So thank you. We'll continue to be meeting with you over the next few months again, and uh, the design will continue to take shape. Questions? Now that the tunnels are built, you can actually go out there and the, the end tunnels where, they, where the openings are actually flare up. And that actually gives us the opportunity to actually sculpt the earth a little bit. So instead of having a totally flat top, we're actually able to um, sculpt some hollows which give us the advantage of wind protection and sheltered environments, but also will actually sort of draw you down and away from that noise environment. Yeah. Secondly, we're really setting back paths and um, uh, overlooks from the edges. So we're trying to pull people in away from the actual tunnel openings. And thirdly, the sort of planting that we're envisioning will be quite dense and will uh, we'll help to ameliorate some of the sound. Well, perhaps this is more of a comment, but when you showed the pedestrian bicycle path, it was not a class one. It was, you should follow the kind of thing they have in the Golden Gate Park where you have the parking uh, and a p pedestrian and bicycle separation, which is much safer than what you were shown. And I think they call it a class one. And then uh, the uh, other thing that I wondered about is, uh, are you accommodating in any way the climate change increase in tidal flow? Well, first, thank you for that comment. We're, we're looking right now at bicycles comprehensively in that whole area. So that's a really helpful comment. Uh, you know, how they'll move. 
we want to make sure to accommodate the movement of bicycles above and below, you know, both east, west, and north, south. So we're looking at this site in the context of that whole area. So uh, because, yeah, yeah, it's a little bit like that. You're right. Um, in terms of climate change and resiliency, uh, it, it is a big issue down here. That whole area uh, of Chrissy Field, the area right around, well, let's put it this way. Building 603, the old Chrissy Field Center, would be an island someday. Um, the building, the finished floor elevation of that building is high enough to be above mean high or high water, but the ground level around that building is too low. So part of what we're building into the plans for this entire area is actually uh, an, an increase in the finished ground level in that area so that it would be above the likely mean high or high water uh, in the future as a result of climate change, and that's something that we're building into the project. Hi. I have enjoyed this presentation very much. I feel that you have heard many of the comments that we made uh, when we had first the original raw ideas, which were of necessity, you know, had a lot in them. And this has become more serene, less complicated. One of the questions that occurs to me is maintenance. We have had, over the years, in certain places where a lot of planting has been done, a real need to keep up maintenance. And I wonder if anyone has thought of an endowment fund that would directly relate to this project. In other words, where a small amount of the money that the Conservancy and the Trust have been putting together for this project could be put into an endowment fund which would give a uh, definite underpinning for annual and monthly maintenance. Thank you. Thank you for that suggestion. Uh, how do you do? I've been involved for a long time. I grew up in this area. Uh, I have two concerns. First of all, it looks terrific. I think you've moved in the right direction. Uh, my first concern is more grass on top of this area. We have the huge uh, main post and we have the Chrissy Field. And related to that is, is the need to have what you call gathering places or a central point. To me, it's a way to get from the main post down in a way that gives you a sense of being in the Presidio. And the more grass you plant, the less I feel it's the Presidio. Uh, so I'd be for minimizing it further, if not eliminating it. And the other issue is what you called, uh, I think you called them a horticultural succulents which to me doesn't look any like, anything like anything I've ever seen here. It looks like Palm Springs or, or a Costa Rica or something. So I would stick with your native uh, species, which you showed very nicely in various parts, which I think you're calling gardens or meadows. Uh, you want to respond at all to those two comments? It would be useful. I'll give you a minute I have left. <laughs> I, I still think you need, we've really cut back the lawn. If you remember the very first scheme, it was almost 100% lawn. It was really drawn from the success of the lawn here in the main post. The lawn areas now are really quite small. I, I would argue that we still sort of need those. Those are opportunities for people to throw down a picnic cloth, fly a kite in an extraordinary uh, context and location. They're really quite small now if we overlaid the scale of those onto, onto what you see outside. Um, the planting, um, uh, a lot of what we're showing is actually drawn from certain locations in and around the Presidio. There's a lot of succulents here. There was a, a long um, history and heritage of, um, uh, of soldiers and their families importing uh, horticultural material from different locations around the world. Um, it's a way to create something on this upper level that's really quite beautiful and quite extraordinary and com contrast that to the lower level. So the learning landscape is very natural and the bluff is very natural. The planting for the bluff is drawn from all of the plantings that you see native on the bluffs here. But this upper level, we do want to create something that's a little more horticulturally interesting. It won't be Palm Springs. It will still have all the characteristics of, um, of, of, of gardens that are characteristic of this area. Hi. I'm a longtime resident next door to the Presidio and um, kind of a history buff of Presidio history. 
So uh, I would like to make a pitch to the new board, uh, some of whom I know, and I think it's wonderful that you're participating, but I want to make a big pitch for historical preservation and historical interpretation. The latter, historical interpretation, I believe has been uh, waiting in the wings. And I think it's time for historical interpretation to come into its own. And I hope that some of the genius and creativity and money and resources and people will soon be uh, dedicated more and more to historical interpretation. There's a lot going on now, I think, by many heroic people that are interpreting and helping us to learn about the history of the Presidio despite very low finances and low um, uh, personnel. Uh, the Park Service, the Trust, and the, con uh, the Conservancy are all involved in this, but it's not a big effort, and I think it's time. I hope you will also start uh, looking at the wonderful, profound, and interesting, and even fun history of the Presidio, and also agree with that. Thank you. I wanted to address the history thing, too. I'm, I'm pushing a, uh, for a timeline that has an extensive history of the, the San Francisco Peninsula. And I'm also pushing for a compass, which I see there, that's one of the items, is a compass rose. And one thing I think is missing, uh, you're not bringing the Palace of Fine Arts into this. I, I think it would be a mistake not to have a seamless connection between the Palace of Fine Arts and the Presidio so that's bike and pedestrian friendly so people can go in between the two of them. So that's my pitch. Good evening. Of the few times that I've spoken, public comment, unfortunately it's always the same subject. It is operational sustainability. One of the things that I think is consistently missing from the conversations, from the presentations, is how do we maintain the Presidio over time? We talk a lot about bringing more people, more traffic, more experiences into the Presidio, but not how to maintain it and make it sustainable over a longer period of time. Right now, with the increased number of people that are coming to the Presidio, what I see on a regular basis, since I'm in the Presidio a lot, is it not being as well maintained as it could be. Trash in the grass, trash at the Presidio, at the Chrissy Field uh, Marsh. It's not being kept as pristine as it could be with the current influx of people. And if we're talking about bringing hundreds of thousands of more people, we don't have operational sustainability. Garbage cans, bathrooms, I know it's not sexy part of the conversation, but these are the things that we need to maintain so that it, Presidio is here for a longer period of time. Thanks. I have one thing that I've been trying to tell everyone. The women of the Presidio have not been very well recognized, and the washerwoman used the creek that went down Montgomery in front of the uh, buildings, and I would like to have that restored, not physically as it was before, but historically by either having plantings or a change in pavement cobble to follow the contours of the creek. You have the old maps, and it would be wonderful if that would be done. Thank you.